Fireside Tales with Wolfgang. Episode 31. Originally broadcast on GWC Productions' YouTube channel, Caps Media Television Channel 6, KPPQLP Ventura at 104.1 FM, and on the KPPQ Podcast Network. Greetings and salutations. I'm Hunter Ackerman, here to read some classic literature for you and my beastly feline companion, Wolfgang. So, Wolfus, what do you want to hear? Walt Whitman, he, he was born in 1819, and he died in, ni- uh, in 1892. So, uh, I mean, the man had full witness of the American Civil War. And um, that will be relevant in some of the some of the things that we read here this evening. Um, <clears throat> uh, Whitman was um, was America's just definitive world poet. He was just he's sometimes credited as being a latter day successor to to Homer, to Virgil, to Dante, to Shakespeare. In one of his his probably his most famous publication, The Leaves of Grass which uh, he published in 1855. Uh, He celebrated democracy, nature, love, friendship. This monumental work chanted praise to the body as well as to the soul and found beauty and reassurance even in death. Along with Emily Dickinson, Whitman is regarded as one of America's most significant 19th century poets and would influence later poets, a lot of them, including uh, Ezra Pound, uh, William Carlos Williams, Allen Ginsberg, Simon Ortiz, C.K. Williams, and Martin Espada. Or, I think that's actually Martin Espada. Um, Whitman Whitman was born on Long Island and uh, grew up in Brooklyn. He received very limited formal education. His occupations during his lifetime, some of those were printer, school teacher, reporter. He did some editing. Uh, Whitman's self-published book, Leaves of Grass, was inspired in part by his travels through the American frontier and by his admiration for Ralph Waldo Emerson. Now, if I've not talked about Emerson before on Fireside Tales, Emerson is one of those guys I hold up there alongside with Henry David Thoreau. So this important publication underwent eight subsequent editions during his lifetime as Witten uh, expanded and revised the poetry and added more to the original collection of 12 poems. Emerson, Emerson the man himself, declared that the first edition of Whitman poetry was, here's the direct quote, the most extraordinary piece of wit and wisdom that America has yet contributed, unquote. Heavy praise from a god amongst transcendentalists. Um... So, unfortunately, at the time, critics and readers alike found Whitman's style, style of writing and his subject matter just kind of unnerving. Uh, according to the Longman Anthology of Poetry, Whitman received little public acclaim for his poems during his lifetime for several reasons. The, his, this openness regarding sex, his self-presentation as a rough working man, so going back to our proletariat conversation on union status of various Disney jobs, uh, and his stylist, his uh, stylist, stylistic innovations. A poet who, quote, abandon the regular meter and rhyme patterns of his contemporaries, Whitman was influenced by the long cadences 
and rhetorical strategies of biblical poetry. Now, I can only assume that this was in reference to the 16 King James edition of the Bible, because uh, say what you like about the Bible, the 1611 King James edition is just worded in some just incredibly beautiful language. It's the language of Shakespeare's time, so that should not be at all surprising. Uh, upon publishing The Leaves of Grass, Whitman was subsequently fired from his job with the Department of the Interior. Despite his mixed critical reception in the United States, he was favorably received in England uh, with Dante Rossetti and uh, Algernon Charles Swinburne among the British writers who celebrated his work. Now, during the Civil War, this, this is kind of an important insight, during the Civil War, Whitman worked as a clerk in Washington, D.C. For three years, he visited soldiers during his spare time, dressing wounds, giving solace to the injured. These experiences led to the poems in his 1865 publication called Drum Taps which included Whitman's elegy for President Lincoln called When the Lilacs Last in the Dooryard Bloomed. After he suffered a massive stroke in 1873, Whitman moved to his brother's home in Camden, New Jersey. And although his poetry did not garner popular attention from his American readership during his lifetime, over a thousand people came to view his funeral. And as the first writer of a truly American poetry, Whitman's legacy endures. Um, I have to throw in one more little little piece about Walt Whitman uh, from Wikipedia. Walt Whitman was an American poet, <clears throat> was an American poet, essayist, and journalist. He was a humanist, and that's why I feel particularly compelled to point this little ism out because that's one of the few things that I will self-identify. I will definitely call myself morally and ethically speaking, I self-identify as a humanist. Um, Whitman was a part of the transition between transcendentalism and realism. Now transcendentalism is one of my favorite movements and Realism was the absolute necessary successor. So Whitman incorporated both views in his works, so he was kind of like a bridge between these various movements of literature. Whitman is among the most influential poets in the American canon, often called the father of free verse. His work was controversial in its time, particularly his poetry collection called Leaves of Grass which was described as obscene for its overt sensuality. I am also sometimes described as obscene for my overt sensuality, well intended as it may be. So I can definitely relate to that part. Whitman's own life came under scrutiny for his then presumed homosexuality. Now, in retrospect, since our consciousness has collectively been raised that homosexuality is no longer that big a deal, uh, pretty safe to say the man was gay. I mean, there's no two bits about it. It's just like, I, I'm, I'm, I, I never heard him make such overt declarations but it's pretty obvious, it's pretty clear, uh, and yeah, 
<laughs> okay, now, now I'm looking back at the chat. Um, uh, <laughs> Um. <clears throat> Thank you, Christina. This uh, th this this shirt. I don't know if you can see it. This is my Greg Loyacano shirt. Uh, Greg Loyacano is uh, the guitar player, one of the founding members of the Mother Hips, and um, yeah, the graphic is kind of dark. <clears throat> In contrast. So, <laughs> yes, it was pointed out in phone conversation today, uh, just literally today, that I can use a clinical sounding term like fertile to describe, uh, to describe a person that is somehow creepy and or controversial when it's like literally clinically accurate and what the party in question was overtly going for. You know. Haters gonna hate, right? Okay, so um, for those of you who know the movie The Dead Poets Society, this was the centerpiece of Robin Williams' career as a literature teacher. This is O oh, Captain, My Captain. O oh, Captain, My Captain, our fearful trip is done. The ship has weathered every rack. The prize we sought is won. The port is near. The bells I hear. The people all exulting. While follow eyes the steady keel, the vessel Grim and daring, but oh, heart, heart, heart. Oh, the bleeding drops of red where on the deck my captain lies, fallen cold and dead. Oh, captain, my captain, rise up and hear the bells. Rise up for you, the flag is flung. For you, the bugle trills. For you, bouquets and ribboned wreaths. For you, the shores are crowding. For you, they call the swaying math mass, their eager faces turning. Here, Captain, dear father, this arm beneath your head, it is some dream that on the deck you've fallen cold and dead. My captain does not answer. His lips are pale and still. My father does not feel my arm. He has no pulse nor will. The ship is anchored safe and sound, its voyage closed and done. From fearful trip, the victor ship comes in with object one. Exalt, O shores, and ring, O bells, but I with mournful tread. Walk the deck, my captain lies, fallen cold and dead. From Leaves of Grass, 1891. I may have misspoke earlier in this cast and said 1855. Um, 1891, that came out. The title of this is I Sing the body electric. Now, if this sounds familiar to you, this inspired the title of the showcase song at the end of the 1980 movie, Fame. And they clearly saved this up in the Twilight Zone because in 1962, the 100th episode of the Twilight Zone which must have been in season four, was an episode written by Ray Bradbury. This later became the basis for Bradbury's 1969 short story of the same name. So this one came from 1855. 
I Sing the Body Electric by Walt Whitman. One. I sing the body electric. The armies of those I love engirth me, and I engirth them. They will not let me off till I go with them, respond to them, and discorrupt them, and charge them full with the charge of the soul. Was it doubted that, th that those who corrupt their own bodies conceal themselves? And if those who defile the living are as bad as they who defile the dead? And if the body does not do fully as much as the soul, and if the body were not the soul, what is the soul? So there are nine stanzas to I Sing the Body Electric, and um, that was number one. I think we're just going to do numbers one and six here. Now number six is predicated upon the, at the time of Walt Whitman's writing, our galaxy, the Milky Way, was presumed to be all of the universe. So, he had said earlier, all is a procession. The universe is a procession with measured and perfect motion. But again, the best astronomy had really gotten dialed in was literally just our own galaxy. Our view was so much smaller than reality encapsulates. Do you know so much yourself that you can call the meanest ignorant? Do you suppose you have a right to good sight and he or she has no right to a sight? Do you think the matter has cohered together from its diffuse float and the soil is on in the surface, and the water runs and vegetation sprouts for you only, and not for him or her? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I love that bit at the end of number one, by the way. I just have to go back and, and reiterate. If the body does not do fully as much as the soul, question mark, and if the body were not the soul, comma, what is the soul, question mark. Um, Whitman was poetically starting to question Cartesian dualism. So there's been this pattern in human thought that goes all the way back to the ancient Greeks, and I'm sure well before the ancient Greeks, just the Greeks were the first to write it down. And Rene Descartes was the first to give it such a, a su succinct name to this concept. Descartes called it dualism. Descartes defined dualism as the belief in the notion that the body is separate from the experiencer. Anime has turned this into a series called The Ghost in the Shell. I love that title. And Whitman was saying, maybe these are not two separate things. Maybe the body and the soul are not divisible in any meaningful way. And if they are, 
what do we even mean by a soul? But that's a deeper question for another time. Saki, who um, is the pen name of H.H. H. Monroe. Uh, interestingly about the guy's name, Saki, as Japanese and alcoholic as it sounds, everything he wrote was extremely, painfully British. This, this story, this story made me think of how some people will do and say strange things to get what they want. And like if you ever hear of a hotel that in any way, shape, or form advertises itself as being a haunted place and um, draws more tourism to it because of this. Like one of my favorite silly conversations that I think I have ever had, the person that I was talking with didn't really see it as a silly conversation. She was asking genuine and sincere questions when we were talking about this um, haunted hotel over in Lake Arrowhead. And she asked if the place that we were referring to was a real haunted hotel. And I'm like, well, I mean, how do you define real in this, in this like definitively fictional sort of thing? Uh, you know, like, like the, the edges of absolute absurdity are well within reach here of this entire conversation. <clears throat> but more on that as the plot unfolds. This story is called The Hedgehog by Saki. A mixed double of young people were contesting a game of lawn tennis at the rectory garden party. For the past 25 years, at least, mixed doubles of young people had done exactly the same thing on exactly the same spot at about the same time of year. The young people changed and made way for others in the course of time, but very little else seemed to alter. The present players were sufficiently conscious of the social nature of the occasion to be concerned about their clothes and appearance and sufficiently sport-loving to be keen on the game. Both their efforts and their appearance came under the fourfold scrutiny of a quartet of ladies sitting as official spectators on a bench immediately commanding the court. It was one of the accepted conditions of the rectory garden party that four ladies, who usually knew very little about tennis and a great deal about the players, should sit at that particular spot and watch the game. It had also come to be almost a tradition that two ladies should be amiable and that the other two should be Mrs. Dole and Mrs. Hatch Mallard. What a singularly unbecoming way Ava Joan Lett has taken to doing her hair, said Mrs. Hatch Mallard. It's ugly hair at the best of times, but she needn't make it look ridiculous as well. Someone ought to tell her. Ava Joan Lett's hair might have escaped Mrs. Hatch Mallard's condemnation if only she could have forgotten the more glaring fact that Ava was Mrs. Dole's favorite niece. It would perhaps have been a more comfortable arrangement if Mrs. Hatch Mallard and Mrs. Dole could have been asked to the rectory on separate occasions, but there was only one garden party in the course of the year and neither lady could have been omitted from the list of invitations without hopelessly wrecking the social peace of the entire parish. How pretty the yew trees look at this time of year, interposed a lady with a soft, silvery voice that suggested a soft, furry thing painted by Whistler. 
what do you mean by this time of year? demanded Mrs. Hatch Mallard. You trees look beautiful at all times of year. That is their great charm. You trees never look anything but hideous under any circumstances or at any time of year, said Mrs. Dole with the slow, emphatic relish of one who contradicts for the pleasure of the thing. They're fit only for graveyards and symmetries. Mrs. Hatch Mallard gave a sardonic snort, which, being translated, meant that there were some people who were better fitted for cemeteries than for garden parties. What is the score, please? asked the lady with the soft, furry voice. The desired information was given to her by a young gentleman in a spotless white flannel suit, whose general appearance suggested solicitude rather than anxiety. Ah, what an odious young cub Bertie Dykeson has become, pronounced Mrs. Dole, remembering suddenly that Bertie was a favorite with Mrs. Hatch Mallard. The young men of today are not quite what they used to be twenty years ago. Well, of course not, said Mrs. Hatch Mallard. Twenty years ago? Bertie Dykeson was about two years old, and you must expect some difference in appearance and manner and conversation between those two periods, mustn't we? Well, you do know, said Mrs. Dole confidentially. I shouldn't be surprised if that was intended to be clever. Has anyone... Have you... Any one interesting coming to stay with you, Mrs. Norbury? Asked the soft, furry voice hastily. You generally have a house party at this time of year. <clears throat> ah, I have the most interesting woman coming, said Mrs. Norbury, who had been mutely struggling for some chance to turn the conversation into a safe channel. An old acquaintance of mine, Ada Bleak. Ah, what an ugly name said Mrs. Hatch Mallard. Well, she's descended from the De La Bleaks, an old Huguenot family of terrain, you know. There weren't any Huguenots in terrain, said Mrs. Hatch Mallard, who thought she might safely dispute any fact that was at least 300 years old. Well, anyhow, she's coming to stay with me, continued Mrs. Nordbury, Bringing her story quickly down to the present day, she arrives this evening, and she's highly clairvoyant. A seventh daughter of a seventh daughter, you know, and all that sort of thing. How very interesting, said the soft, furry voice. Exwood is just the right place for her to come to, isn't it? There are supposed to be several ghosts there. Ah, that is why she was so anxious to come, said Mrs. Nordbury. She put off another engagement in order to accept my invitation. She's had visions and dreams and all those sorts of things that have come true in a most marvelous manner, but she's never actually seen a ghost, and she's longing to have that experience. She belongs to that research society, you know. Hmm. I expect she'll see the unhappy Lady Cullumpton, the most famous of all the Exwood ghosts, said Mrs. Dole. My ancestor, you know, Sir Gervais Cullumpton, murdered his young bride in a fit of jealousy while they were on a trip to Exwood. He strangled her in the stables with a stirrup leather after they had come in from riding, and she is seen sometimes at dusk going about the lawns in the stable yard in a green habit, moaning and trying to get the leather thong from round her throat. I shall be most interested to hear if your friend sees... I don't know why she should ex be expected to see a trashy, traditional apparition like the so-called Cullumpton ghost that is only vouched for by housemaids and by tipsy stable boys when my uncle... 
who was the owner of Exwood, committed suicide there under the most tragical circumstances and most certainly haunts the place. <laughs> Mrs. Hatch Mallard has evidently never read Pobble's country history, said Mrs. Dole, icily. Or she would know that the Cullumpton ghost has a wealth of evidence behind it. Oh, Popple, exclaimed Mrs. Hatch Mallard scornfully. Any rubbishy old story is good enough for him. Popple, indeed. Now, my uncle's ghost was seen by a rural dean who was also a justice of the peace. I should think that would be good enough testimony for anyone. Mrs. Nordbury, I shall take it as a deliberate personal affront, if your clairvoyante friend sees any other ghost except that of my uncle. I, I dare say she won't see anything at all. I mean, she never has yet, you know, said Mrs. Nordbury, hopefully. It was the most unfortunate topic for me to have broached. She lamented afterwards to the owner of the soft, furry voice. Exwood belongs to Mrs. Hatch Mallard, and we've only got it on a short lease. A nephew of hers has been wanting to live there for some time, and if we offered her, if we offended her in any way, she'll refuse to renew the lease. I, I sometimes think these garden parties are an absolutely mistake. The Nordburys played bridge for the next three nights till nearly one o'clock. They actually did not care for the game, but it reduced the time at the guests' disposal for at the guests' disposal for undesirable ghostly visitations. Miss Bleak is not likely to be in a frame of mind to see ghosts, said Hugo Nordbury. If she goes to bed with her brain a whirl with royal spades and no trumps and grand slams. Well, I've talked to her for hours about Mrs. Hatch Mallard's uncle, said his wife, and pointed out the exact spot where he killed himself and invented all sorts of impressive details, and I have found an old portrait of Lord John Russell and put it in her room, and told her that it's supposed to be a picture of the uncle in the Middle Age. If Ada does see a ghost at all, it certainly ought to be old Hatch Mallards. At any rate, we've done our best. The precautions were in vain. On the third morning of her stay, Ada Bleak came down late to breakfast, her eyes looking very tired but ablaze with excitement, her hair disarranged, and a large brown volume hugged under her arm. At last, I've seen something supernatural, she exclaimed and gave Mrs. Nordbury a fervent kiss, as though in gratitude for the opportunity afford, afforded her. A ghost? cried Mrs. Nordbury. Not really. <laughs> really, unmistakably. Was it an oldish man in the dress of about fifty years ago? asked Mrs. Nordbury, hopefully. Nothing of the sort, said Ada. It was a white hedgehog. A white hedgehog? exclaimed both the Nordburys in tones of disconcerted astonishment. Yes, a huge white hedgehog with baleful yellow eyes, said Ada. I was lying half asleep in bed when suddenly I felt a sensation as of something sinister and unaccountable passing through the room. I sat up and looked around, and there, under the window, I saw an evil, creeping thing, a sort of monstrous hedgehog of a dirty white color with black, loathsome claws that clicked and scraped along the floor, and narrow yellow eyes of 
indescribable evil. It slithered along for a yard or two, always looking at me with its cruel, hideous eyes. Then, when it reached the second window, which was open, it clambered up the sill and vanished. I caught up at once and went to the window. There wasn't a sign of it anywhere. Of course, I knew it must be something from another world, but it was not till I turned up Popple's chapter on local traditions that I realized what I had seen. She turned eagerly to the large brown volume that had been under her arm and read, Nicholas Harrison, an old miser, was hung at Batchford in 1763 for the murder of a farm lad who has accidentally discovered his secret hoard. His ghost is supposed to traverse the countryside, appearing sometimes as a white owl and sometimes as a huge white hedgehog. I expect you read the Popple story overnight, and that made you think you saw a hedgehog when you were only half awake, said Mrs. Nordbury, hazarding a conjecture that probably came very near the truth. Ada thought about the possibility of such a solution to her apparition. Then Mrs. Nordbury followed with, This must be hushed up said Miss Nordberry quickly. The servants. Hushed up, exclaimed Ada indignantly, indignantly. I'm writing a long report on it for the Research Society. It was then that Hugo Nordbury, who is not naturally a man of brilliant resource, had one of the really useful inspirations of his life. It would be very wicked of us, Miss Bleak, he said, but it would be a shame to let it go further. That white hedgehog is an old joke of ours. A stuffed albino hedgehog, you know, that my father brought home from Jamaica, where they grow to enormous size. We hide it in the room with a string on it, run one end of the string through the window, then we pull as if uh, from below, and it comes scraping along the floor, just as you've described, and finally jerks itself out the window. Taken in heaps of people, they all read up Popple and think it's old Harry Nicholson's ghost. We always stop them from writing to the papers about it, though that would be carrying matters too far. Mrs. Hatch Mallard renewed the lease in due course, but Ada Blink has never renewed her friendship. Ah, yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad we found a, 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 a bed, an old bed to suit the beast. Thanks for staying with me, buddy. <clears throat> yeah, so sometimes people will lead supernatural conclusions to that which benefits them. Uh, in this story, there is a cat named Pib I have no idea if the creators of Mr. Pib were Alcott fans, uh, but they do indeed end up referring to the cat as Mr. Pib, and bear that in mind. Much like Wolfgang, Mr. Pib is quite opinionated. <clears throat> This is A Happy Birthday by Louisa May Alcott. A certain fine old lady was 73 on the 8th of October. The day was always celebrated with splendor by her children and grandchildren, but on this occasion, they felt that something unusually interesting and festive should be done because Grandma had lately been so very ill that no one thought she would ever see another birthday. 
It pleased God to spare her, however, and here she was, almost as well and merry as ever. Some families do not celebrate these days, and so miss a great deal of pleasure, I think. But the people of whom I write always made a great deal of such occasions, and often got up very funny amusements, as you will see. As Grandma was not very strong, some quiet fun must be devised this time, and the surprises sprinkled along through the day, lest they be too much for her if they all burst in upon her at once. The morning was fine and clear, and the first thing that happened was the appearance of two little ghosts, all in white, who came prancing into the old lady's room while she lay placidly watching the sunrise and thinking of the many years she had seen. A happy birthday, Grandma, cried the little ghosts, scrambling up to kiss the smiling old face in the ruffled nightcap. There was a great laughing and cuddling and nestling among the pillows before the small arms and legs subsided and two round rosy faces appeared, listening attentively to the stories Grandma told them till it was time to dress. Now, you must know that there were only two grandchildren in this family. But they were equal to half a dozen, being lively, droll little chaps full of all manner of pranks and considered by their relatives the most remarkable boys alive. These two fellows were quite bursting with the great secrets of the day and had to rush out as soon as breakfast was done in order to keep from letting the cat out of the bag. Terrible, terrible phrase. Who keeps cats in bags? Right? Yeah. 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 A fine dinner was cooked, and Grandma's favorite niece came to eat it with her, bringing a bag full of goodies and a heart full of love and kind wishes to the old lady. All the afternoon, friends and presents kept coming, and Madame, in her best gown and most imposing cap, sat in state to receive them. A poet came with some lovely flowers. The doctor brought a fine picture. One neighbor sent her basket of grapes, and some poor children whom Grandma had clothed and helped sent her some nuts that they had picked all themselves, while the grateful mother brought a bottle of cream and a dozen eggs. It was very pleasant, and the bright autumn day was a little harvest time for the old lady who had sowed love and charity, which she had broadcast with no thought of any reward. The tea table was ornamented with a splendid cake, white as snow outside, but rich and plummy inside, with a happy posy stuck atop the little Mount Blanc. Mrs. Trot, the housekeeper, made and presented it, and it was so pretty all voted not to cut it till evening, for the table was full of other good things. Grandma's tea was extra strong and tasted unusually nice with Miss Hawsey's rich cream in it. She felt that she needed this refreshment to prepare her for the grand surprise to come, for the family gifts were not yet given. The boys vanished directly after tea, and shouts of laughter were heard from Aunt Tribulation's room. What larks as they had up there, no one knew, but everyone was sure they were preparing some fun in honor of the occasion. Grandma was not allowed to go into the study, and much tacking and rummaging went on for a time. Then all the lamps were collected there, leaving Grandma and Grandpa to sit in the parlor, talking tenderly together by the soft glimmer of firelight as they used to do 40 years ago. Presently, something scarlet and gold, feathery and strange, flitted by the door and vanished in the study. Can I turn the page, dude? Wait, I need that. I need it. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah, something colorful flitted by the door and vanished in the study. Queer little yells and the sound of dancing feet were heard. Then there was a hunt for the cat. 
next, Miss Trot was called from the kitchen, and all but the boys came to escort Grandma to the scene of glory. <laughs> Leaning on Grandpa's arm, she marched first. Then came Miss Kubity, the mother of the boys, uh, uh, bearing Aunt Carmine's picture, for this auntie was over the water and could not come. So, at Grandma's desire, her portrait was born in the procession. Aunt Trib followed, escorted by Thomas Pibb, the great cat, with his best red bow on. Wolfgang, by the way, will not wear a bow under any circumstances. He will, however, shred them by the half dozen. <clears throat> Mrs. Trot and Belinda, the, the little maid, brought up the rear. A music box in the hall played the Grand March from Norma, and with great dignity, all filed into the study to behold an imposing spectacle. A fire burned brightly on the hearth, making the old-fashioned andirons shine like gold. All the lamps illuminated the room, which was trimmed with scarlet and yellow leaves. An arch of red woodbine, evergreen, and ferns from the white mountains was made over the recess which held the journals, letters, and books of the family. For their name was Penn, P-E-N-N, -N, and they all wrote so much that ink blots were found everywhere about the house, and a flock of geese lived in the backyard, all ready to have their quills tweaked out at a minute's notice. <clears throat> Clearly, ball points were not yet available. Before this recess stood a great armchair in which the father of Grandma had been laid as a newborn baby and nearly smothered by being sat upon by the fat nurse. This thrilling fact gave it peculiar interest to the boys, for if Great Grandpa had been smashed, where would they have been? In front of this ancient seat, stood a round table loaded with gifts. And on each side stood an Indian chief in full costume, bearing lighted Chinese lanterns on the ends of their spears and war clubs on their shoulders. The arranging of these costumes had caused much labor and fun, for the splendid crowns, a foot high, were made of hen's feathers carefully collected and sewed onto paper by Aunt Trib. The red shirts were fringed and bedecked with odd devices. Leather leggings went above the warrior's knees, and all the family breastpins were stuck about them. Daggers, hatchets, clubs, and spears were made by the lads themselves, and red army blankets hung gracefully from their shoulders. They had planned to paint their faces blue and red like the Fiji Islanders at Barnum's show, but Miss Kubity would not consent to have her handsome boys disfigure themselves. So the only paint they wore was nature's red in their cheeks and heaven's blue in their eyes as they stood by Grandma's throne, smiling like a pair of very mild and happy little chiefs. It really was a fine sight, I assure you. And Grandma, Grandma was quite overcome by the spectacle. So, she was introduced to her gifts as quickly as possible to divert her mind from the tender thought that all these fond and foolish adornments were to please her. Every gift had a poem attached. And as the presents were of every description, the verses possessed an agreeable variety. Here are a few as a sample. A small tea kettle was one gift, and this pleasing verse seemed to be bubbling out of its spout. A little kettle, fat and fair, to sit on Grandma's stove, to simmer softly, and to sing a song of Freddy's love. Another was this brief warning tucked into a matchbox. On this you scratch, your little match. When the spark flies, look out for your eyes. When the Lucifer goes, look out for your nose. Little Jack gives you this with a birthday kiss. A third was rather sentimental from Miss Kubity. 
Within doth lie a silken tie To dress, to deck, soft and warm As daughter's arm round mother's neck Mr. Pibb Are you listening? This is where the cat comes in Yeah, yeah, you with me? Okay Mr. Pibb presented a mousetrap And in order to explain his poem I must relate an incident in his varied career. It, that's right. The cat both gave a mousetrap as a present and wrote a poem to go with it. Yeah, he's with us. <clears throat> Pib had long been one of the family and was much respected and beloved by them all. In fact, he was so petted and stuffed that he grew as fat and big as a small dog and so clumsy that he could no longer catch the mice who dodged about amongst the dishes and in the kitchen closets. No, that, that part doesn't apply to you. He could definitely catch mice if we had any in the cabin. In vain had Miss Trot shut him up in there. In vain had Aunt Trib told him it was his duty to clear the cupboards of such small deer. Poor fat Pib only bounced about, broke the china, rattled down the pans to come out with empty paws, while the saucy mice squeaked scornfully and pranced about under his very nose. One day, Aunt Trib saw Pib catch a squirrel, and having eaten it, he brought the tail to her as a trophy of his skill. This displeased his mistress, and she gave him away. After a good scolding for killing squirrels and letting mice, his lawful prey, go free, Gave the cat away. Ooh. Pib was so depressed that he went into the bag without a mew or scratch and was borne away to his new home in another part of the town. You hear that? They put him in a bag to take him and give him away. What awful people. No, what an awful person. It was just the auntie. But... He had no intention of staying. And after a day under the sofa, he paused in deep thought, and without food or drink, he made up his mind to go home. Slipping out, he traveled all night and appeared the next morning, joyfully waving his tail and purring like a small organ. Aunt Trib was glad to see him. And when he had explained that he really did do his best about the mice, she forgave him and got the trap for him to give to Grandma that she might no longer be annoyed by having her private stores nibbled at. This is from Pib. <clears throat> Dear Madam, with respect, my offering I bring the hooks all baited well and ready for a spring. No more the cunning mice your biscuits shall abuse, nor put their babies to sleep within your fur-lined shoes. The trap my work must do, forgive your portly cat, for he, like you, has grown for lively work too fat. All larger, fiercer game I gallantly defy, and squirrel, rat, and mole beneath my paw shall die. So, with this solemn vow, T. Pib his gift presents, and sprawling at your feet, purrs forth his compliments. Isn't that awesome? The cat wrote the best poem of all of them. Yeah. <clears throat> Which he actually did, and then sat bolt upright on the rug, surveying the scene with the dignity of a judge and the gravity of an owl. Such funny presence. 
a wood box and a water carrier, a blue and gold gruel bowl and a black silk apron, a new diary, and a pound of remarkably choice tea. A pretty leather, <clears throat> a pretty letter on birch bark sealed with a tiny red leaf and a bust of the wisest man in America were some of them. Interesting, this is not an edit. She doesn't actually say who the bust of the wisest man of America depicts. Avoiding controversy, clearly. How the dear old lady did enjoy it all, and how grateful she was for the smallest trifle. An old friend sent her a lock of her mother's hair, and the sight of the little brown curl made her forget how white her own was as she went back to the time when she last kissed that tender little mother 50 years ago. Fearing that tears would follow the smiles too soon, Aunt Trib announced that the famous Indian chiefs Ching Cheng Popokati Puddle and Pocky Hockey Clutter Yar would now give a war dance and other striking performances to represent Indian customs. Then, all sat round, and the warriors leapt into the middle of the room with a war whoop that caused Mr. Pibb to leave precipitously. It was the most exciting spectacle, for after the dance came a fight, and one chief tomahawked, scalped, and buried the other in the space of two minutes. But the ladies mourned so for the blonde little Hockey hockey clutter yar that he had to come alive again and join in a hunting expedition during which they shot all the chairs for buffalo and deer and came home to roast a sofa pillow over their fire and feast thereupon with the relish of hungry hunters. These exploits were brought to an end by the arrival of more friends with more gifts and the introduction of the birthday cake. This was cut by the queen of the fate, and the painting and the panting chiefs handed it round with much scuffling of big moccasins and tripping over disarranged blankets. Then all filled their glasses with water and drank the toast. Grandma, God bless her. After which the entire company took hands and danced about the big chair, singing in chorus, Long may she wave, and may we all hear her dear face live to see. As bright and well at seventy-four, as now at seventy-three. The clock struck ten, and everyone went home, leaving the family to end the day as they began it, round Grandma's bed with goodnight kisses and the sound of her last words in their ears. She said, it has been a beautiful and happy day, my dears. And if I never see another, you may always remember that I thought this one my best and brightest birthday. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Fireside Tales with Wolfgang. To view more of my work, check out my YouTube channel at Hunter's Acoustic Cabin. Directed by Hunter Ackerman. Produced by GWC Productions. Originally broadcast on GWC Productions' YouTube channel, CAPS Media Television Channel 6, KPPQ LP Ventura at 104.1 FM and on the KPPQ Podcast Network.